day of uh, the 2023 Company of Ideas Forum. Uh, we are so happy to have everybody and uh, continue on actually an initiative that uh, Chero has really um, uh, pushed for, which is the inclusion of artists in the forum. The forum is really a, a, a product of Jeffrey's um, uh, interaction with his uh, other daughter who back in 2007 Six, seven was mentioning that her friends were becoming interested in uh, some of his ideas. And so um, actually, um, Jess was actually at the first forum, uh, which is uh, one of the friends of, of uh, his daughter, Liba. Um, and initially, it was quite uncomfortable to include um, other artists. Vaughn had the unique um, distinction of being a, a permanent, a permanent fixture in the forums, and a, and a good friend of, of Jeffrey's, uh, and so uh, we've been blessed to have his perspective. Uh, but we've we've increased the presence of artists, and I think uh, James, you could talk a little bit to, to that. But we're really happy to have this day focused on practice, and and it's going to be a little bit of a different format. So we're really excited that you're all here, and uh, please support the artists and ask lots of questions, and and uh, we. We, the, the register of the discussion may change a little bit from the, uh, the jargon that we're uh, so used to throwing around yesterday. Uh, so yeah, welcome everybody and I'll pass it over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Corinne. This is going to be a much more interactive format today compared to yesterday. There's going to be conversation. Uh, they're going to be, um, uh, we're going to hear some things. We're going to see some things. We're going to be up and around in the park as well. So it's actually quite good. It's not so blazing, uh, blazing uh, sunshine above us. Um, so hopefully it'll be lots of fun. And um, uh, we've got four speakers this morning as we did uh, as we did yesterday, and I just want to introduce the first of them, although I don't think you need a, much of an introduction. Um, <laughs> Paul Wald, this is your third uh, visit to the forum, um, and you've been particularly helpful to me, actually, over the last 12 months in, in helping me shape some of the ideas that went into this forum, so thank you very much uh, for that, Paul. Um, Paul is an award-winning, internationally uh, recognised artist, composer, curator, and a professor of uh, visual arts at the University of Victoria. He's a major figure in North American arts. We're very lucky to have him back and to hear about his work. And he's also the perfect example of the kind of artist I described yesterday. He moves effortlessly between the images and sounds, between the scene and the herd, between disciplines and media. So what we're going to do over the next 20, 30 minutes, Paul and I are going to have a little bit of a conversation about his work, and then we're going to open, uh, open up for, for a broader conversation and questions. Um, so please, everyone, welcome Paul Wald. Thank you very much. And it is wonderful to be back here again and uh, really appreciate uh, being here. And it's always a, little, a delight. So. Oh, yeah. thank you, Paul. Yeah. Well, so, Paul, you started out as a painter who was doing music and the music you were doing and the painting you were doing were completely disconnected from each other. What um, motivated you to bring those two practices uh, together? Yeah, well, I, I quite intentionally kept them separate uh, because at the time, uh, and we were talking about this yesterday, uh, I was working at a gallery in New York and the, the, the dealer who I quite respected, he told me, whatever you do, don't tell anybody that you're a musician because they, they won't take you seriously uh, as an artist. And so I, I took that to heart and really did try to keep them separate for quite a long time. Um, but I, after a while, I moved back to Canada and... Uh, started working with shape uh, forms in the, in the landscape, and so this is a piece from uh, 2001 uh, that I started in 2000, uh, looking at forms in nature. So I was making a lot of woodcut prints of found surfaces that I was finding. So I was printing porcupine knot plywood, uh, trees that were gnawed by beavers, uh, and uh, and I decided because I was in that complete isolation that nobody cared what I was doing, and so I, these distinctions didn't matter to me. So, um, and I'll just forward up to here. So I cast, a, a beaver actually took down a tree right in front of my studio, and uh, my studio assistant and I went out and cast this thing and brought it inside, and when I brought it inside, it reminded me of music notation. 
And so that was my first uh, thought of making music outside of playing in a band. And so this is how I translated it. And I didn't realize at the time that this is... Uh, this process is called sonification. So it's taking visual information and translating it into uh, something that you could hear. And I talked to one of my students at the time who was more literate on using computers and said, you know, do they make software that can you can put notes into and then you can hear them? And he said, yes, they do. It's called scoring software. And so we, we got, got one of those. And, uh, and then you could output it as a, as a MIDI file, which is a musical instrument digital interface file, which is these very small files that uh, activate different musical instruments. So that allowed me to hear what was going on. And it also allowed me to edit uh, from what I was hearing. Uh, and that from that, we produced a string quartet. But I'm just going to back up and show you a little bit of the installation that resulted from that. And so it was this idea of translating forms that I was finding in nature into different cultural forms, so wallpaper, um, these uh, hand-finished sticks that made this kind of designer beaver lodge. And then there's a DJ booth in the middle, and, and I invited people to come and do remixes of the, uh, of this, of the score. And um, so we did that during the run of the, 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 the exhibition. And uh, so I produced a string quartet, and it was the first, I thought that was uh, uh, kind of as far out as I could imagine these marks being used for, uh, not knowing what, why beavers do what they do exactly, except they're trying to feed themselves. So I can, uh, can play a little bit of that, and you can ask the next, next question. because it's so beautiful. Um, just to clarify, the, the notes themselves, so the process of sonification meant that these notes were, were, were based on the pattern of the marks that have been left on this wood. That's right, and then, and then re, you know, taking uh, little chunks of it, uh, which I called sketches, and then editing those to make a longer piece. Oh, yeah. so, and I found this process of, like a, a collection of notes that might not make sense once they're repeated, uh, they create their own context, and so that sounds, things that might be random, when they're organized, they become music, which I think is maybe one of the, some kind of definition of music, maybe, uh, is creating its own context through repetition of sound. Beavers can really compose, can't they? Yeah, they can it's do, they, very do great, they did a great job. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, were you inspired by, uh, was it mostly nature at this point that was inspiring you? And were there other sources of nature that were, that were generating works for you as well? Yeah, so, the, and so this is jumping ahead now to, to 2010. Uh, became more interested in the science of landscape, I guess, and looking at research papers on uh, different phenomena in nature. And I read a paper about how bats, uh, or sorry, how moths developed uh, ears so that they could evade bats, uh, which is their, uh, one of their major predators. And so uh, I wanted to see if I could work with that in a different way. Uh, and, and one of the themes you'll see in my work is using musical instruments as uh, cultural signifiers to try to um, get people to hear in a certain way. And, um, and this comes from John Cage's 433 Seconds, where he's asking people to hear the, the ambient sounds of the room. Um, and using a performer to situate people's attention, uh, which is a way of attuning people to use the part of the brain that they, they use to hear music, which is uh, a different place than just regular hearing. Uh, and I don't, and, I, and I, mean, I don't think Cage was thinking about it that way at the time, but, but to me that's the, one of the, the, the geniuses of that, because uh, neuroscience has shown that we hear um, music differently. So, um, so I'm using mu musical instruments as a way to attune people's attention in a certain way. Uh, and this is using stage lighting and a PA system. And what's happening in this work is uh, uh, I'm attracting moths and other insects to the drums. Uh, and each drum is, is tuned differently. And I've created a score where they're 
the lights turn on and off in a certain sequence to attract them to different areas. And then using the, and they're highly amplified, these drums, so you can hear moth wings on the surface of the drum. Um, but I'm also using uh, field recordings of bats that are running through the same system, which are very hard to hear. Uh, it sounds like a little hissing sound. But the, uh, and I wasn't sure if this would work or not, but it, but it does uh, when the moths hear the sound of the bats. Or the sound, they they drop onto the drums in little clusters and then drum around on the on the the drums. So uh, so that's what's happening here. Uh, and here's the score. So what James and I agreed to talk about was different different modes of scoring in in my work uh, as, as a way of pointing to uh, sonification and other kinds of uh, approaches to organizing sound. So uh, you can see the array of, of drums, uh, and each little dot is where uh, the light turns on and off. And so I gave this to a, 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 a lighting technician, and he programmed a, a DMX uh, lighting controller. And so and it just plugs in, and these things, uh, they turn off, and, turn off and on in the sequence. So there's a, a picture of the a rather large uh, moth coming down to the, to the lights. And, and you can see all the, all the little streaks of our, our um, other bugs that are down there. And uh, I can play a little clip of that too. Hopefully it'll work. Maybe, no. It says, it says there should be audio there. Oh yeah, here. You ever wonder what moths playing drums sound like? This is, <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> these are these are the kind of things I wonder. So, <laughs> and you can hear the lights kind of phasing on and off too, which which at first I I didn't like, and then subsequently I was like, this is this part of the composition is hearing the lights. And in both of in both of those pieces is is, is chance and and uh, it, it very important to you. Do you like that the the unpredictability of using nature to generate these these sounds? Yeah, totally. I, I yeah, I, I do. Uh, and and that's something I've, I've embraced in my work, uh, partly through uh, an interest in in John Cage's work, which he started embracing. Uh, chance operations in, in the early 50s in, in his work. Um, and I found that very freeing uh, because like, when you're, a lot of artists, we, we tend to be control freaks. We want we to control everything that's going on in our, in our work. Uh, and, but you obviously you can't control everything. And one of the beautiful things about chance operation is, is opening it up for possibilities that you haven't thought of. And, and so it allows the work to develop in ways and directions that you might not have been able to predict. So. Now, we've talked about sonification as one very important aspect of your, your work. Another important method is something called graphic notation. Um, can you tell us what graphic notation actually is? Because some people won't know what it is, um, and where it, where it came from, and, and how you, you've gone on to use it. Yeah, um, I think... Well, graphic notation has been around for a very long time, but in contemporary, well, modern music, uh, the origin story in American music kind of goes back to, again, to John Cage and his relationship with Morton Feldman, who is another composer, uh, American composer, working at the same time, younger than Cage. Um, but in 1950, Cage uh, was starting to work with chance operations and was talking to Morton Feldman about how to bring indeterminacy into music. So have, writing scores that didn't have a set output. And uh, the, the, the story that I read is that um, Morton Feldman, they lived in the same building. Feldman went up to his loft and came back about two hours later with this uh, grid score. And, and so what he, he does is have, has little markings that show uh, approximately 
uh, what range the musician should play in and approximately the time and how long they should play for. But he doesn't tell them exactly what note, note to play. So there's, a, it's much more open to interpretation. Uh, so that was a 1950 uh, projection number one. Uh, and uh, that got Cage onto using graphic notation and then it's just plur pr proliferated uh, from there. Um, so many people, composers are using that now. And trying to find other ways of notating that doesn't require uh, such uh, a specialized way of communicating as um, standard notation, which is normal music notes, which is, is, is a real skill to master, which I'm not very skilled at it, uh, but, I, but I try when I need to. Yeah, so this, this is a piece that is uh, a graphic notation that's made with mushroom spores. Uh, it's, again, it's an homage to Cage. Not all my work deals with Cage, but we're the, the ones we're showing this morning uh, just happened to. Um, Cage was also uh, an avid mycologist uh, and quite uh, renowned for, for his knowledge. Uh, he won a a game show in Italy uh, with questions on mushrooms and uh, was a help restore the, the New York Mycological Society and actually taught a course on, on mushrooms uh, at the New School in New York. So, um, and he's, he was born in California and so these mushrooms were collected just north of where Cage is from and uh, created a, a, a score for uh, two musicians or a right hand and left hand and so here's a look at the, the score installed and a, and a close up. Beautiful. And we can play a little, Let's hear uh, some. Play a little clip of that. So when I'm using graphic notation, I try to be as clear uh, with, with the musicians as I can. So uh, I think uh, not, not all scores are like this. Some, some are completely interpretive. Um, but I, I give quite clear instructions on how to interpret the, the mark. So the, the location uh, has to do with the pitch. The size of the, the mark has to do with the, the amplitude. Um, and then I ask them to shape the sound based on um, the, the, the shape of the, the spore print. Um, so When yeah. I look at the, 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 the slides, particularly the, the one previous to this one, um, or the two, actually one before that, when you see the gallery, it's, it looks, you know, at first sight, it looks like a, an exhibition of, of abstract paintings on a wall and very, very beautiful images, very carefully uh, curated and displayed. Um, can I ask, when you're, when you're having an exhibition or when you're conceiving a work, is there does the visual and the and the all you know and the, does the sort of the visual element of it and the musical element of it do they uh, um, evolve in exactly the same at the same time with the set and that they equal priorities for you or do you think of the visual first or is the visual simply a tool to get to the to the musical all of the above. <laughs> so, you know, it depends on the piece. It depends on the, the concept. I usually have an idea of what I'm doing, and then I allow the concept to drive the drive the work. And so, um, sometimes there's more of a visual in my mind, or, and sometimes it might be more uh, of a sound that I'm interested in working with and developing that. But quite often, it's it's really locked together. Uh, so, and that's one of the reasons I started. Uh, composing or having to call myself a composer because a lot of artists work with composers um, but I wanted to lock the concepts of the visual and the sound together and so that was really important to me uh, even though I don't come from a composing background I you know I studied piano when I was a kid and now, that's about it <laughs> now let's talk about this work because I think uh, this is the work probably 
that you're most famous uh, uh, into, you know, around the world for this work. Can you just tell pe the people who, I mean, you did mention it briefly when you were here last year, but there are a lot of uh, new uh, new members of the of the forum this year. Can you describe this really quite extraordinary work and, and the, in, the in, idea behind it? And maybe we can hear in a little 30 bit seconds or less. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, we can take a couple of minutes. To, yeah. I'll try to summarize it. Uh, so this is a piece called Requiem for a Glacier, which is a... Uh, a four movement oratorio um, that took place on uh, the Farnham Glacier uh, in rural BC in the East Kootenays. Uh, it's a site that was under threat for research, uh, re uh, sorry, uh, real estate development. They were trying to build a, a ski resort uh, and sell condos. Uh, the, the development was based on climate change, so when it's too warm to ski in Aspen, Colorado, they wanted to lure rich people up to BC to ski. Uh, but it also happened to be a sacred site for the Tanaka people. Uh, it's the place where this grizzly bear spirit goes to dance, so it's a very spiritual place. Um, and they've been fighting this development for over 30 years uh, when I was invited to come and do something uh, in Caslo, BC, uh, which is south of here. Um, and the curator at the time wanted to bring Northern Symphony, which was the first piece I showed, um, but it just wasn't possible to do that. And so I asked if we could come up with a new work. And I wanted to deal more directly with climate change, uh, with my interest in landscape. Climate change was starting to become more and more of an issue. Uh, I had been dealing with it in my work for uh, almost 10 years at that point and wanted to make a, make a piece that more readily uh, worked with that, that um, theme. And so the idea of, of writing a requiem uh, for this particular glacier, a premature requiem, because the glacier is still there, but it's, it's in trouble, uh, came up. And so right when I started working on it, the BC government released a press release announcing the approval, the final approval of the development project. Um, and I decided I wanted to work with that text. And, but I was also working with Latin requiem texts. And eventually decided that the best way to deal with this uh, political statement was to translate it into Latin. So everything was in Latin. Uh, and wrote this for uh, an orchestra and choir, which was something I hadn't done um, prior to this. And so this is how I get in trouble all the time, is taking on new things that I have no idea how difficult it's going to be until I take it on. Um, but it, but it, it, it worked out quite, quite well. And uh, the clip I'm going to play is, a, is an example of sonification. So the third movement, I'm sonifying the average climate uh, reading. So I got Environment Canada data uh, from that mountain and uh, translated each year into a 12-beat a 12, uh, 12 note. Uh, and then overlapped one year to the next, so uh, sonifying the temperature readings. Um, so, and what happens is you hear the notes go up and down, but the general trend is up, so you can quite literally hear uh, the temperature changing. So I'll play a little bit of that, play it'll work.
Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And there's a lot more to discuss about this work, not least because Daniela knows the piece very well. Did you conduct it? Uh... It was Glenn Elms, actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is Requiem. This is Requiem, yes. yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, well, we'll come back to your maybe your interaction with Paul's work. Um, but there's next. there's one other um, process that you often use and in, in your practice. And so we've talked about sonification. We've talked about uh, we've talked about graphic notation. The other thing is this idea of instructional scores or event scores. Uh, can you tell us what those are and and uh, give us an example of how uh, you've used them? Yeah. Um, so again, going going back to my interest in Cage. Uh, Cage taught a course at the New School, not just a course on mushrooms, but he also t taught one called Composition, uh, and then later renamed Advanced Composition. Uh, and in that course, it was open to musicians, but also non-musicians. And a lot of people who took the course uh, ended up being some of the primary artists in the Fluxus movement. So uh, folks like Dick Higgins, uh, Alison Knowles, uh, Alan Capro, um, George Brax, uh, who also, Al Hansen was there. Um, and so they all took this course and uh, Cage would send them home to write compositions and they to collectively developed this way of uh, writing these little event scores. So they often um, resemble poetry. They're quite short. Um, if anyone's seen Yoko Ono's Grapefruit, uh, it's that kind of instruction that tells people how to do an action. Um, and some of those actions uh, would have uh, a sound output to them. And so I like to use that um, method of scoring when it's something that's more performative, uh, less specific on what the sound might be. And um, I also find it particularly useful in uh, dealing with scientific things, so scientific principles. It's easier to communicate those things uh, through a set of instructions rather than translating in, into notes. Uh, but sometimes I will also do that. So Daniela, one of the things Daniela, uh, we did this for the concert at Kamloops was uh, translated the output from uh, a, an instructional score back into standard notation so we could perform it live. Yes. <laughs> so it's always kind of a bit of back and forth. And actually, uh, uh, I was reading, just doing a little brush up on Morton Feldman last night, uh, and uh, Cage described Feldman's standard notations as Feldman's interpretations of his own uh, graphic notation. So, uh, yeah. And can you, um, Paul, can you show us an example of, uh, I think you yeah. have an example, yeah. don't you, of go how, how that, that kind of score uh, had been used. So that that is that what you would call an instructional score? Yeah, absolutely. So this one, and I try to be as concise and short uh, as I can with these things, uh, and to produce the the widest amount of uh, output. So hopefully this will play. And I don't know if I can fast forward through this or not. Oh no, I'll go back there. Hopefully it's playing. Sorry, there's a bit of a an intro on this one that shows the, the landscape. Well, they will make sound in a moment. And is this the same landscape of, from Requiem for a Glacier? No, in the same area? No, this is, area? this is in Alaska. So I, I did okay. a, a residency in 2016 uh, as part of the, the Anchorage Museum's uh, Polar Lab residency, uh, bringing scientists and artists together to respond to the landscape there. Uh, and they really wanted people to go all over Alaska to do this work, but I really wanted to stick around Anchorage, uh, the Anchorage area, and uh, deal with the landscape there, which is quite phenomenal. And, uh, and even people from Anchorage actually said, I haven't quite looked at my, my landscape. Uh, <laughs> That's about my backyard in the same way. It's 
almost like a record, isn't it? This is a, yeah, I'm the, I'm the human record player, <laughs> and this is a large stylus that, that, I, that I made that has a contact mic on the end, and, and it's, the recorder is actually my pocket. So, uh, and I'm wearing headphones so I can hear what's being recorded while, while it's while doing this. So you get a bit of a resonance of what the, the ice was like. And there, was, there was snow on top first so you're getting the snow crystals and everything like that uh, in there but any cracks that were in the ice are picked up as well it's probably more of a, a noisy a noise piece I guess but uh, I quite like it that's great <laughs> well I just want to ask you one final question and then we'll have 15 minutes for others to ask questions um, what I want to ask you about is I suppose um, what we talked a little bit before in the introduction yesterday about the labels that we give artists, painters, sculptors, composers. How do you feel you fit into that, that sort of categorization of artists? What do you think of yourself as? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, I tend to just describe myself as an in, interdisciplinary artist or intermediate artist. I like a lot of uh, the inter the intermedia genres that came out of out of the '60s from, from Fluxus. So the combining of different disciplines, um, so sound art and performance art. Uh, but I work across these different mediums, and they cross-pollinate in, in a good way. I think some artists do try to keep these practices separately, but I decided at a certain point that I had to just expand my practice to allow my full creative practice to be able to be encapsulated within this uh, in a way to kind of incentivize the, act, the actions that I'm doing. But also, you know, I bring my, I consider my teaching practice as part of what I do as well. So... That way, I'm not resenting being being at the university and, <laughs> and feeling like I'm I'm doing my my thing. So yeah. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I mean, there's obviously much more to discuss, and you've got lots of other slides and other works you can show us if uh, if we have yeah. the time. Does anyone um, have any questions for Paul? I mean, it's such thought provoking uh, work. Does anyone want to to kick us off with a question? Yes. Well, we've got lots already. So we'll go for Megan yeah. and then Vanessa and then Josh. Fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. I just have a question about this piece. Um, pretty simple one. After the video and after this performance piece was taking place, did you... I'm just noticing that there's a lot of like markings left on the ice by the tracing and, and the actions of your body. Um, did you take those images and, and use them further? I, I didn't. No? Okay. But that's a good idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there's Vanessa and then, uh, and, then, and then Josh and then uh, we've got Pascal as well. Lots of questions. I think that was absolutely fascinating. I love the playing with nature idea. It's, it's super clever. It's super clever. So I, um, actually, funnily enough, I I was new to graphic notations a few years ago, and then we um, organized some in the UK between an artist called Nicola Dervasuda, who'd done some med meditations on her local seascapes, and a, a composer, violinist, who just played the work. Um, and I wondered, I mean, for Nicola, it was an interesting experience just having, putting the picture out there and seeing if someone interpreted it in a way that was meaningful and captured what she'd intended to express, I guess. Have you had that experience with your work where you've just handed over the visual or the other to someone else? How I would you feel about it? I tend to want to direct things a little bit more. I, I want my sound or music compositions to have a, an identity so that, so that they're recognizable as things. Um, so I tend to give more direction to the music, which, you know, I happen, I think that that is, uh, in some ways, a generous approach because I'm not just pushing them off the deep end and asking them to do all the work of the interpretation. Uh, and so they can focus on the performance and what, what it is about that information that I want them to focus on. So, there, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to do that. But if you're for um, interdeterminacy, which is the, uh, the mushroom spore score, um, that one, 
I really want them to be focused on the shapes and zone in on that and um, not have to worry about uh, other aspects of, of interpreting it. So, yeah. Thanks, Paul. As I, again, I'm just always really excited to hear you talk and hear the work. So, um, And I have two questions, one that's maybe more uh, contentious, and I won't do that one. I'll do the first one, and then we can go around and oh, let's, uh, let's maybe... Let's get contentious. Can... Okay, well, let's, okay, do, so let's do it. Okay, so with the, first, the first one, I'm, I, what, I, what I see in the installations, what I see about the process is scoring, and then I'm just really excited to know how depth fits in shape, because it's a translation from... You're re-articulating... A, a three-dimensional sort of sp space process. How, how do you find depth in in scoring? Like, how do you add depth to the piece that, the, like, a three-dimensional has shape to the music? Because I can hear it and I can see it, and and so. Yeah. I, well, I think that there's like sonically. Yeah. yeah. How do you how do you create depth? I, I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, in, in some of my installations, it's using m multiple instruments spatialized in an environment. Um, so that creates, uh, you know, audio depth. Uh, I, I am a monaural hearer. I can only hear out of one ear. So uh, I have to use my imagination often to imagine what it's going to sound like. And then I count on uh, other people whose ears I trust to create that kind of spatialization uh, and make sure it's doing what I want. But I, I generally have a an understanding of how sound can be yeah. orchestrated in a way to create depth. And so, uh, yeah, there's lots of different techniques for doing that. So whether it's through textures or, um, you know, having sounds of different frequencies performed at different volumes will approximate some kind of depth as well. Mm -hmm. So you can have a very high pitch sound that'll cut across something that's louder and lower and make it sound like it's farther away. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I do like artists who, composers that use three-dimensional space in interesting ways like, um, uh, drawing blank on names right now, but yeah, there, there's, Lots of people that have yeah. experimented with this, um, for sure. Yeah. And if, I mean, if you want the more contentious g question. G so, bring uh, it on. Let's well, just maybe uh, think of Ewan, Ewan Campbell at, at Churchill College. He works. Uh, they, he worked with um, uh, um, environmentalists, and, and they did a piece on uh, tracking well sounds to the Brady's um, um, score. And it was really a phenomenal work. But one thing they were looking at is trauma in the natural environment. And I'm wondering how the human hand uh, and how you you scored um, music uh, with the moths in sort of an emotional state, right? They are in a moment of trauma because you're calling, in a way, calling attention to where their presence is and the bats are essentially hunting them. Yeah. So you're actually capturing more than, I mean, it's a ph phenomenal work. that I really like the drumming uh, piece because you're essentially capturing music and Christ, a moment of sort of crisis even. Yeah, I've heard, I've, someone else has, this is not the first time I've, I've heard this uh, argument with that piece. Um, I don't know what the moths are thinking. Yeah. And, and I don't know if it's, if it's more of a reflex or if it's actual fear. Uh, but yeah, someone, uh, someone actually really didn't like the piece because they, they were concerned that the moths were being harmed. They're not, they, they fly away after, uh, much less than getting attracted to moving cars and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's just something that they, the same way that we avoid things we don't want to hit, uh, or if they're actually terrified. So, you know, it's, it's hard to know. Um, but, you know, it's, it, and I don't think I was as, attuned to uh, the natural world as much as I am now in the work. And I think I've become more ecological in how I think about all the, the things that are out there. And I'm doing a lot of work with uh, forest researchers and looking at forest ecology um, and, uh, and combining that with indigenous knowledge. And so that's the, way, the one of the directions the work's going in now, which is much more, um, I said, compassionate 
than than that piece, which is which is kind of a, it is kind of a cold piece too. You're you're hearing electricity, you're hearing uh, highly amplified drums, and yeah, so. I know that lots of people want to ask questions, but I'll just take through. We've only got really time for three more. So we'll go for Seth and then Pascal and then Daniela. I think oh, sorry. Pascal, you go first and then Seth and then Daniela. Uh, mine's a pretty quick question. I just found that the, uh, the composition by the beavers and the mushroom composition, in my mind, which is just a human perception, that they sort of matched the behavior or the personality, let's say, of mushrooms and beavers. Are the musicians aware of what they're composing when they are looking at the graphic scores? Do they know that they're playing mushroom music or oh, playing? They, they, yeah, for sure. Okay, so yeah. I was just curious yeah. if there might and, be. And that, that recording, I should say, is that that's a, a group that an ensemble I belong to called Experimental Music Unit. So it's a trio, and we did a whole concert of uh, mushroom-based compositions. Uh, including this guy Vaclav Halleck, who uh, Czech composer, who apparently could hear mushrooms and he would transpose what they were singing singing to him, and so they're quite unusual, difficult things to play. But uh, there might be some human yeah. influence in the perception of how they sound, perhaps. Yeah, and, yes. I, and I think okay. presenting it in that context, people are expecting mushroom music. So there. Yeah, so, uh, it sounded like mushroom music. Yeah. So. Thanks, Paul. Uh, really great to see a little um, retrospective here. Um, so my, my question follows on a bit from Pascal's comments sure. um, about this concept of sonification. I'm really curious to hear your take on this. So allow me to set this up for just a second. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe throw a little small polemic into it and then ask you to respond. I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Um, so sonification is a pretty common tactic in the sound art world. Um, people use it for all sorts of different reasons and with all sorts of uh, different um, uh, inputs for you know things to be sonified. And as far as I know, the first example of this and maybe the one that tells us the most about what people think they're doing when they sonify is this story uh, from the German poet Rainer Maria Rilke. Do you know this story? No, I don't. I don't. Um, he, t he writes about how when he was a young student, he, in sort of elementary school, I think, his teacher showed the class how uh, phonography worked. So put a needle on a surface. It might have been a record. It might have been something else. I'm not sure. With a, with a paper cone and showed how uh, the phonograph needle can amplify grooves into something sonic. Um, and then he talks about how a little bit later, maybe when he was a college student, he went to an anatomy lecture where the, um, the professor was talking about the coronal suture, the lines in the skull that oh, are yeah, formed when the, um, when the plates of the skull come together in infancy. And so Rilke then says, well, now I put these two things together. and What if we could play the coronal suture with a phonograph needle? And then he says, what would we learn about that skull? And he says it would complete our experience of the skull, which has always struck me as a very strange claim. Like, how would hearing the coronal suture complete our experience? How would that add anything new to what we understood about the skull or the person whose skull it was? Or, you know, maybe you could train anatomists to, to learn to listen to skull phonography to make some kind of diagnosis, but to my knowledge that has not yet happened, so I don't, yeah. I don't know that it's really very functional. So, so I have a, a pretty deep skepticism about sonification. Uh, I wrote something called the, about the transposition fantasy, as I called it, this idea that you can transpose something from one sense modality into another and therefore learn more about it or understand it more deeply. And I'm very, you know, very skeptical about that. Yeah, so I, wanna, I just wanted to throw this at you and ask uh, how you think about sonification in terms of the relation of the output to the input. Yeah, and I, I have to say that I personally am very skeptical of, of sonification. And, um, and I try to use it. Uh, when I use it, I want to have a reason for doing it, I guess. Um, it's because I teach sound art to my students. It's a very kind of entry level kind of thing to, especially with MIDI. Like people will, I, I, and I get people send me stuff all the time. Like someone sonified this thing, or and uh, some of it is interesting and some of it isn't. Uh, like people putting 
uh, electrodes on, on mushrooms and then uh, running it through some kind of algorithm and getting it to make mushroom music, you know, I, I get that all the time. So, uh, you know, I, I, and I, and I, because I know what the, I have a sense of what the data is doing and there's all kinds of choices that you have to make when you're sonifying something. So when you're taking a data set and sonifying it, uh, you have to make choices about, you know, what, what's the range of frequencies I'm going to use? What's the, um, you know, what's the duration of each data node? And I, I think I, there's, I think there's a lot of sloppy sonification going on, I guess is, is what, so, uh, in Requiem, uh, when I'm using it, uh, I wanted people to hear, be able to hear that the temperature was getting changing. But it's it's in inside of a larger piece that's doing all kinds of other things. So it's not just oh here's my sonification piece uh, and that's it. And and I think a lot of artists would have been satisfied just to to do that. But I wanted to create a larger experience around that and. Um, and and with the mushrooms, uh, it it really is. I, I would say that piece is a little more playful than 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 definitely requiem. So um, it's uh, my basis for it was that Cage always said that mushrooms and music have nothing to do with each other except they appear next to each other in the dictionary. And so I was trying to disprove that in some way. Uh, so, and, and I did, I liked the way it came out. So, uh, but if I wasn't happy with the composition, uh, I wouldn't have done a thing with it. So, um, uh, we probably share a lot of the same skepticism about, about these things because it's, it's everywhere now. Uh, and people are, and I, and I feel like, People are not very, I don't know, they don't seem to be very critical of the process, but there's, uh, there's a lot, like I said, a lot of artistic choice that goes into sonification that gets swept under the rug a little bit, I think, as, as though uh, this is uh, as pure a translation as, as a photograph is, that it's somehow documentarian in some way, but it's not. Yeah. Fascinating to overhear your conversation. Uh, so, uh, one final question from Daniela, and then we will move on to our next uh, our next session. Actually, it's ten o'clock, and it's time for Jess's turn. So, I think I can uh, continue this my my question and my comment with uh, with the rest of you guys later. Are you sure? Yeah. Well, it's just I'll I'll, I'll put out some foreshadowing. <laughs> No field recording, sonification, or recording is ever truly innocent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, they're, they're, they're artistic, express, you know, they're expressive tools. And, and people have to understand the same way as when I compose a photograph, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's outside of the photograph, and, I, and I'm choosing to show that information in that way. So, uh, yeah, any... Any of this stuff is not, um, it's not immune to that. And, and so uh, I try to make that evident in the work, I think. Yeah, I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's evident that, that there's an artistic hand. Um, and yeah, with, with allowing for chance operation too. So I don't, I don't have a super heavy hand, I don't think, but, it, but there's, there's creativity going on in there for sure. So. And, and, and I'm un unapologetic about about uh, <laughs> being you. If I'm if I'm using an artistic output, uh, I think people are should be accepting of the fact that that there's um, artistic choices going on. I, that's why I'm not writing a paper about it, or I'm not doing a documentary. I'm making a an installation or a composition or something. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for sharing some of your work. I think you can tell from the questions and from people's faces how engaged and, uh, and, and fascinated they were by what you do. Uh, so can we give Paul a round of applause?